Hello world, have you ever wondered what the art style of read-only memories would look like on a CGA graphics card? Well, wonder no more, for we have the Land of the Seasogs. Or Professor Meme in the Land of the Seasogs, as the main menu puts it. Possibly episode 1, but this menu screen is the only mention I've seen of that anywhere. Unless Epo 1 means something else. The shorter version of the title is also the one used when the developer, oops, sent me a free Steam key for the game, so I'll probably stick with that. It's available for Windows and Mac OS on Steam, and it starts something like this. Professor Meme receives word from his old friend Dr. Gustav, a mysterious and ominous message, beckoning the professor to a research base on a distant, inhospitable planet. A hefty trip for a 164-year-old man, but he does it. Safe to say this takes place in the future, since A. People don't seem to live that long right now, B. Don't travel to other planets, and C. There's some dialogue later on that suggests there's been a fourth world war. Dog only knows how the human race survived those, but we'll put that aside for now. When the professor arrives, he gets stationed in Dr. Gustav's quarters, as the good doctor is nowhere to be found, something the professor only finds out once he lands. And from there, our good professor boy starts to investigate exactly what's been going on here and find out what the hell a Seasog is. Actually, there's another scene which sets up even more mystery, taking place between Dr. Gustav and his counterpart Dr. Vazgut. Uh, see what you did there? Kind of. Problem is that it only plays when you boot the game up for the first time. My initial recording was broken, and try as I did, no matter how many registry settings I fiddled with or files I deleted from the relevant app data folder, I could not make the scene appear again. Except that you're quite obviously watching footage of that scene because I eventually found out what the reset game option does. Well done me. Speaking of the main menu, that's where I discovered the blue on purple colour scheme this game loves so much and the music of Mark Sparling. Music which reminded me even more of Read Only Memories, although that's no bad thing. That said, most of the scenes are either very subdued in their music or entirely bereft of it, sticking with ambient noise instead. While I'm here, the game doesn't offer much in the way of options, but you do get a choice of English US, English UK, Spanish and Galician? I think that's the first time I've seen that language as a choice. Mind you, I've not been very good at paying attention to language lists in the past, so perhaps I missed it. Kinda cool to see though. So how does this bad boy play? Well, it's a side-on view more reminiscent of 2D platformers than pointy clicks as we know them today, but you're still talking to people and using items, all that business. That said, the talking to people isn't even that big a part of the game. There's only a handful of characters, and if their dialogue is ever meaningful, it's pretty much always relegated to a cutscene. Even when that's not the case, there's a chance that the same big-ass introductory conversation will repeat itself whenever you talk to someone, regardless of whether or not you've had it before. Other characters don't have this problem, I guess it must have been an oversight. So forget that for now, let's focus on the rest of the gameplay. Pretty much the only exciting non-standard parts are moving between floors, either within rooms with this gravity lift thing, or out with rooms using your traditional elevator type contraption. Your cursor will change depending on what you can do with an object. So it's a one button interface we're dealing with. Unusually, inventory is on permanent display here and has you click and drag items to use them on the things. Unlike other purveyors of this interface that I could mention, this game at least tells you what the item is when you drag it. And with the low resolution aesthetic this game uses, that's a welcome addition indeed. Some way of getting a description might have been nice though. Next to the mighty inventory, we have a button for reading your journal, another welcome addition for indicating the thoughts and feelings of the protagonist for players who want that kind of thing, and a reminder of what you're supposed to be doing. I think. More on that later. The journal also records clues you find for certain puzzles. Kind of gives away which information is important when some of it is written down and some of it isn't, but I'll take that over having to backtrack. It also notifies you when a new entry is added. I like that. Speaking of puzzles, that's as good a time as any to go through the negatives. The staples of the genre are here, some object inventory puzzles, some implementing a passcode you found somewhere, and I would say they're well implemented, but for two instances. At one point you need to gain access to an area in order to use a thing. Sounds standard enough, the old locked door puzzle is a well-known classic with many distinct forms. The game never actually tells you that the thing is there at all, and any attempt to examine the room's contents results in you hitting the barrier meaning that you have to break into the room before you know why you're doing it. The journal would be the way to keep you on track with these, but it honestly doesn't do that good a job. 
plenty of pros about the good professor's predicament, as I mentioned, but it will not always nudge you in the right direction. Of course, I'm assuming that the journal does indeed hold this dual purpose in the first place, but if I'm stuck in an adventure game and I have a journal, that's where I'm looking first. Unless the entries are particularly lengthy because I can't concentrate for long enough to read them all. The second instance would be the obligatory nitpick of the episode. The game will sometimes make you interact with an object twice. For example, you look at a chest of drawers and a consequent click will let you open them. In most cases, the game would change the cursor after the first interaction, and I'm not complaining about those. But there's those few cases where you have to move the mouse to get it to update to the new icon. If you didn't move the mouse, it would still be showing the look icon instead of the hand one, and it makes it look like the second interaction isn't worth it, you're going to get the same result. Then again, Windows still suffers from that problem with its busy cursor sometimes. Like I said, nitpick. Everything I've talked about takes place within a span of no more than two hours, and to be frank, it didn't grab me. I can appreciate some of what the story was trying to do, although really there's no new ground broken, and whilst having a permanently visible inventory went out of style some time ago, I think they got the most of the interface right. Whatever nitpicks I have don't detract from it being a simple, easy to use interface that you don't need to think about too much, letting you focus on the game itself. But since there's so little to see, that's not a great thing despite good intentions. The word Seasog might sound quite fascinating, but the developer didn't exactly go to great lengths to explain what they actually are. Without spoiling much, it's an aquatic alien species which has potential applications in the field of mad science, and they're native to this planet that Dr. Gustav plonked his research base on. Not quite a MacGuffin, but not very well explored without diving into some of the optional text. I guess I'd call this game a good first attempt. It doesn't feel janky or awkward to play, and for the most part I didn't encounter any bugs, a point I'm about to undermine by mentioning a bug I encountered. My cursor disappeared at one point, and I was forced to go back to the main menu and continue, essentially reloading an old save. At which point I discovered that you will always continue from the starting room rather than whichever room you were in when the game was last saved. I don't agree with this move. I find it rather silly. And that wasn't even the time I managed to talk to a character who had already walked off screen, but I kinda did that to myself. I knew nothing good would come from me trying to talk to the spot where the man once stood, but my QA instincts got the better of me. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that we're dealing with a £4.79 game with original music and no voice acting which lasts just over an hour. It's at a level of quality I expected, and unfortunately that doesn't leave a lot to talk about. It's hard to muster up any strong feelings for something that is, by and large, average. A fantastic game is great to gush over, a terrible game is fun to mock, but an average game is much harder to conjure up words for. And yet it does kind of sum up what I'm trying to say. It's average. Hello, thanks for watching to the end. If you're so inclined to leave a comment, a like, a dislike, whatever you fancy, please do. Or if you really like what I'm doing here, I do have a Patreon if you want to contribute money. Links in the description. Thanks again and cheerio.